Well, one of the things in the wintertime I like doing is looking at old vacation pictures and to kind of dream of vacation. And I came across the photo this week from 2003. Um, so it's kind of an old photo. And this is when we were down in uh, Hatteras, North Carolina, which is one of our favorite uh, vacation spots. And this picture, as I got to it, I kind of got taken back. This was one of my favorite memories ever in, uh, of our Hatteras vacations. This was back in 2003. It was a day, I think we caught 27 tuna or something like that. Is that right, Linda? She, she keeps count. She keeps count of all those things. But 27 tuna in one day. But, but anyway, we decided we were going to go out on a charter boat and go offshore fishing and, uh, for tuna. And the, this great result, and, and you see this picture at the end of the day, it was, though, far from what our thoughts and our hopes were earlier this day. So as I was thinking about that, I thought of that entire day. What happened was we left the dock really early in the morning, like before the sun gets up, and, and when we left the dock, it was a decent morning and everything. And as we uh, kind of rode around the tip and through the inlet, um, things changed quickly. We noticed a couple things. First of all, we looked out the, f- the front of the boat as we're heading offshore, and instead of seeing a beautiful sunrise like we usually saw, it was a wall of black. And we're like, well, that doesn't look good. And then what we saw were two boats coming the other direction, coming back in. These were two boats that had left the dock right before we did, and they were already coming back in because it was too rough for them. So we're sitting here, oh, what are we going to do? And it was at that moment where we're sitting here going, what's going on here? That the captain, he slowed down the boat and he came down and, and, he, and he had a talk with us. And he said, listen, he said, I'm sure you noticed up ahead all the lightning and the storm. He goes, it's a bad storm. But he said, but I want to tell you, the fish in the last couple of days has been the best it's ever been down here. It is off the charts. And he goes, doggone it, I want to get out today. And he says, and I think we can make it. Now, I don't know about you, when somebody says they think you can make it, and they, they're out there every day, you're like, he goes, no, no, no. He goes, I looked at the storm on the radar, and I think we can punch right through this. And once we do, man, it'll be a beautiful day out there. And he goes, and it's going to be amazing fishing. We're like, well, we only come down one time a year, so we're like, we'll give it a shot. What do we know, right? I can swim. So anyway, so we go, and so he, he rams up the engine, and we start going, in, and it was like going into the perfect storm. If you ever saw that movie, as they're going into that, and everything gets black, and then the wind starts, and then the waves start to build, and the rain's coming down. I mean, we had to go inside, and we're holding on to anything we can hold on to to keep from, like, being tossed around. I mean, and the boat's going, and pounding, and we're just like, maybe we made the wrong decision, you know, and, 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 as suddenly as we had gotten into this storm, though, all of a sudden, the boat hit one final wave, and then it just went. And we're like, well, maybe we're dead. But, and we weren't. And I looked outside, and all of a sudden, the sun came out. And I looked around, and the seas were glass calm. And there was no more wind. And better yet, I looked behind us, and you could see the storm that we just poked through. And there was not one other boat out there. We had this offshore fishing grounds all to ourselves. And let me tell you, the fishing, obviously, it was as advertised, and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. You see, the storm, as bad as it was, paled in comparison to how great it was on the other side. You see, what we found out that day was the best was yet to come. And it was just as the captain had told us. You know, when it comes to us facing suffering and trials and storms in our own life, you know, it it helps to encourage us to endure that suffering, to know that no matter what we're going through, the best is yet to come. What's on the other side is far greater than any suffering could ever be that we need to go through. Did you know that? That's what Paul shares with us this morning as we return to Romans chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up Romans chapter 8. We've been in this for a couple weeks now, and we're going to be in it for a couple more weeks. So we're smack dab in the middle of Romans 8. And if you remember, in Romans 8, Paul kind of takes this turn of, you know, he's talking about how we're saved and all of these things and coming to justification. And now he starts this talk of what's called sanctification, this big word, which means we're declared holy before God and we're becoming holy, right? 
more holy in our outward lives. And it's basically how do we live out our lives as a child of God or what it means to belong to God. So in chapter 8, he's talked a little bit about that. And if you remember our first message in chapter 8, we saw that, you know, the Holy Spirit is in us, you know, and being led by the Spirit, it means that he invites us to make ourselves at home in who Jesus says we are, to believe what Jesus says about us as a child of God. And then last week, we looked at what happens as well, is that when we come to faith in Christ, that then God assures us that we belong to him. And there's some markers for that, trail markers we talked about, right? Things like, well, we know we belong to God because we battle with sin. We don't like sin. We know we belong to God because we cry out to him as our dad, right? And those are great things. I mean, they're really awesome. But we also know that we belong to God. In verse 17, as we closed last week, Paul kind of slips this in, and he says, if you look at verse 17, it says, provided that we suffer with him. And we're like, well, yeah, I mean, battling sin, that's good, you know, because we're getting better, we're showing things in our life, crying out to God as our dad. Man, it's great having a dad that we can cry out to, and, and that's awesome. But suffering... I don't know that I want to do that. How many people want to suffer? Not many of us want to suffer, right? That's kind of weird. Yet, Paul's sharing this, and he's saying this is a good thing, that we suffer with him. But for us, we look at that and we say, that's a downer. Yet, what Paul goes on to explain now, what we find out this morning is that going through this suffering, it actually is a great thing. You see, because Paul talks about this suffering, actually for the remainder of chapter 8, our next three messages in chapter 8, are all about how we deal with the trials of life, how we deal with living out our life here, living in a fallen world, where we're going to face trials and suffering. And he, he kind of wants to encourage us to endure, endure, keep faithful as we live out these lives. So beginning this week in verse 18, he starts on the first way that we do this. And he, and he encourages us as we stream into the storm ahead. He says, take heart. Be encouraged. The best is yet to come. So let's pick up in verse 18 and we'll kind of read a little bit and see what Paul's saying about suffering this morning and how we keep faithful to God living in a world that we live with all of these things coming at us. He says in verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who had the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For or in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So Paul begins his talk about enduring, right? And he starts off pretty strong here, right? Basically what he's saying is the, the sufferings of this present time, he says in verse 18, aren't worth comparing to the glory that is to come. The tough stuff we're going through now is nothing compared to how great it will be just ahead. The best is yet to come. And then he goes on to explain why the best is yet to come, and especially in the light of our suffering. And he's talking about suffering, right, of this present time, how we suffer this present time. And he's talking about suffering in many different ways. He's not just saying, you know, well, when we suffer for, for, you know, 
standing up for God at our workplace or our school and, you know, people tease us and things like that. He's not just talking about persecution, although the the churches in Rome, they're facing intense persecution for being followers of Jesus, and they're facing this kind of persecution and even death, but he's even, it's even broader what he's talking about in suffering. He's speaking more than just religious persecution. He's also talking about the common difficulties and struggles of living life here in this world. How many people know that? Living life in this world is full of difficulties, isn't it? If you're a parent and you got young kids at home, you you know that, right? If you're getting older and you tried to get out of bed this morning, you know that, right? That, man, this world, just living in this world, it's not always easy. And in fact, he goes on to explain two huge realities that are coming to those who belong to God. These two things that were coming that will help us endure whatever we may be facing right now. You see, here's what Paul's telling us. He's saying, you know what? We can endure suffering right now because first of all, all of creation will be renewed. So the first thing he talks about is creation, right? He talks about the created world, everything that was created, the physical world, is what he's talking about here. And physically, all things will be renewed. That which is created by God. This includes our entire world, right? And everything in it, the sky, water, animals, and even us. You see, when God created, way back in Genesis, and when we went through Genesis, we saw at the end of creation, right? At the end of each day of creation, what did he say? It was good. Then at the end of all of creation, the end of day six, he says it was very good. Now, that's just, not, oh, it was good, like, you know, B plus work. He's saying it, in good, it's perfect. This is exactly how I want it to be, and it will, it will be this. It is designed to not decay, not to fall apart. Everything's at peace. Everything's at harmony. Everything is great. Yet something happened, didn't it? Sin. Sin entered the world. And when sin entered the world, it went from being good to suffering. In fact, look at some of the words that, that Paul uses here to describe creation now. Futility. In verse 21, right? He says it's subject to futility, or vanity is another word for that. It's in bondage to decay. It can't help but fall apart. And it's, it's, it's having pain. Our world is, is falling apart. It's decaying. It's warring against itself. We see this in the animal world, right? Animals fighting animals. We see this with plants and things, how, how plants are dying. We see it through, through, through nature itself, through the weather and natural disasters that are coming. And things are just dying and being destroyed. And even our own bodies, we see it, don't we? We're falling apart. Like, I need to bring that up, huh? But creation isn't like it was supposed to be. We're like God created it. It's something changed. And the culprit of all of this change isn't climate change. It's not global warming. You know what it is? It's sin. This is why it went bad. It's because of sin. When sin entered the world, God not only cursed man, Right? He cursed the serpent. He says, on, the, on your belly you'll lie, you, you'll crawl. And he cursed man. He says, you know, from the day that, that on the day that you eat of the tree, I tell you not to, you will die or you will start to decay. But do you know God also cursed creation? Check out Genesis 3. It says, and he said to Adam, this is when Adam sinned. He said to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorn and thistle shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat plants of the field. So you'll be destroying nature itself. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. 
<laughs> so you know what God's saying? Because of sin, creation is suffering. And physically, we suffer. We go through things, right? And we don't have to go f- too far to see this suffering of the physical, do we? I mean, we fight against nature. We, 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 we ourselves, we're, we, we, we see things falling apart we see violence against people you know people having violence against people animals having violence we see sickness and disease we face a daily reminder that we are one step closer to the grave yay this is really uplifting isn't it isn't this great to hear honestly you got out of bed for this this morning just remember that but it's great to hear right no it's kind of bleak isn't it And you're sitting there going, man, this stinks. But you know it's true. However, this suffering in the physical world, it's heading somewhere. Paul says it's groaning. It's crying out in pain. But do you know that all groaning isn't the same? Theologian John Piper talks about this. He says, you know, you don't have to go far to see that all groaning out or crying out in pain isn't the same just go to the hospital and you'll hear cries of pain have a much different result to them whether you're on the oncology floor or the maternity ward one is people crying out because their body is dying the other is crying out because something great is about to happen life is about to spring forth so not all groaning is a bad thing So what Paul's saying here is is our bodies reminding us that we're growing older? It should get us down. Yeah, when we get up and we're like, oh, you know what that should remind us? There's something good that's coming. There's something good, right? In fact, you know, he, he talks about this, right? He says, verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Until now. So something great is coming. This suffering that that we're going through physically and our earth is going through physically, it's temporary. In fact, it's this source of this eager longing that Paul mentions in verse 19. He says, you know, it, it waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Or when those that belong to God are revealed when Christ returns it's all going to change it's going to be when christ returns all creation is going to be renewed it's going to be made new perfect again it's going to be made good in fact revelation gives us a description of it right um God reveals to John and says, well, at that time, the lion will lie down with the lamb. Would you ever see a lion lying down with the lamb now? But yet when God returns, guess what? After when Jesus returns, that's going to happen. It's brand new. And not only that, but our whole world will be new. It says in Revelation 21, it says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea is no more. So what we have now is going to pass away, but there's going to be a new creation. And this new creation is going to be created good, without sin, without the effects or or the stain, the curse of sin. Isn't that great? You know, but as the infomercial goes, but wait, there's more. Not only will our world be new, but our bodies will be new. Do you know that? When Jesus comes, we're going to receive new bodies. Now, uh, Scripture never tells us what these new bodies are necessarily going to be like. Like, what age are we going to be? You know, are we all going to be 18 years old? You know, are we going to kind of look the same? Are we going to recognize? We're never told that. But we know that our bodies are going to be new. And they're going to be different. Because they're going to be imperishable. They're going to be perfect. They won't be subject to decay. In fact, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We won't all sleep, but we'll be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling eye, at the last trumpet, which is when Christ will turn, right? For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. We'll be given new life. New bodies, actually, because it says, and we shall be changed. For this imperishable body must put on the imperishable... 
and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that's written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Suffering, it doesn't matter because what's to come is so much better. <laughs> that's what Paul's saying here. So even our bodies are going to be brand new and that's coming. Isn't that great? So as we get up today or as we, as we go about our week this week and we're walking around with aches and pains, for some of you that are in track as you run your race tomorrow and you're tired and you're, you have to get up out of bed the next day and you're sore, guess what? That's coming to an end. We're going to have a brand new body and we're going to be in a brand new creation that is not affected by sin, which means it's no longer cursed, it will no longer decay. That's cool. We'll have a new body. No disease, no pain, no acid reflux, no joint discomfort, no cancer, no decay. All creation will be new. You see, physical suffering in this world and in our body is a result of sin. And when sin is conquered and done away with, Suffering in those who belong to God will cease. That's why the best is yet to come. This renewal of creation, it far outweighs what we might be going through right now. And it should be a source of encouragement to endure with joy and with glory what awaits us. You know what that means? Those that belong to God, we can age great. And we don't have to be sitting there saying, oh, I feel horrible. Oh, I just wish. No, guess what? Because we know what's coming. So you know what? I don't mind this. I don't mind having a sore back when I get up in the morning because I know that's temporary. What's coming is so much greater and that will be for all eternity. There's no comparison, Paul says. But of course, you know, all suffering isn't physical, is it? How many suffer in not physical ways? Maybe emotional ways or spiritual ways, right? We also face persecution for our faith, struggles in our relationship with God. You know, we face, we face persecution from others that might not be physical, but it might be Emotional and, and people ridiculing us and making fun or dis, discrediting us or just their hatred and scorn, you know, for being a Christian in our world today. And we can also face other suffering internally, Paul says, right? He says, you know, we groan inwardly in our spirit as we battle things going on in our spiritual life. Do you ever suffer and battle and get angry because... We can't do what we want to do spiritually. Paul just talked about that in chapter 7, right? The things I want to do, I can't do. And the things I don't want to do, I keep doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. There's a battle going in spiritually, right? There's suffering going on. You know, things like habits and addiction and despair and shame caused by our struggle with sin. We struggle with these. And we struggle with these even though Paul says in verse 23, we've experienced the first fruits in the Spirit. Or we've experienced what it can be. What Paul's saying is, we have a taste though of what it means to belong to Jesus because of the Holy Spirit in us who, who reminds us, right, who we are in him, that we can make ourselves at home. But it's like, it's like a, a farmer and he has one of his work hands and he goes out and he picks the first tomato of the season and he brings it, right, the first fruit. And he says, this is what awaits us for the season. But it's just one tomato. But what's going to be coming is amazing. And this is what Paul's saying. So the Spirit comes into us, and it gives us a taste of what it means to belong to God. And it's great. But yet, it still wars, right? The Holy Spirit wars with our spirit. There's an internal struggle going on with all of that. And the Spirit is, is, is trying to help us. In fact, next week we're going to see the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Okay? Because we still have them. So Paul's saying, you know, so we still struggle sometimes. And... I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I know things, but I don't always believe them. I know things that God says about me, but I don't always believe that. 
So for Paul says, because of that, we groan inwardly. Verse 23, right? He says, in our spirit, spiritually, as we eagerly await, or we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might say, wait a minute. Just last week, we talked about this adoption as sons, right? In fact, we saw in verse 15, and you look back to verse 15, Paul already said we've already experienced adoption as sons, right? He says we've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We've already been adopted. So what is this saying? We're eagerly awaiting adoption if it's something we already have. Well, it helps to understand the adoption process in the Roman world. Paul's talking to the Roman world, so understand it in its context. And in the Roman world, the, the, the adoption process, even though it was immediate, where the, fam- the child would come and live with the family, it still came in stages. It's kind of like sanctification, right? We talked about this idea of sanctification. We're declared holy before God, yet we're becoming holy, more holy each and every day. So there's a process of it. It's immediate, but there's a process. Adoption works the same way. So the first stage in adoption is the child is fully made a child of this family. They come and they live with the family and they are a child, a son of this adopted dad. Fully. Legally. But yet there's another stage to the the Roman adoption process when now this child is publicly acknowledged as belonging to this family. So there's one that's internal. The child goes and lives with the family and it's set on paper. But then there's like this ceremony or this party, we'll call it, where now people sit, get to see this adopted child. It's revealed to the world that this is my child, even though he is my child already, but now I'm revealing it. He's my child. Do you see the difference? So it's publicly revealed. And this is what Paul's talking about. We're we're eagerly waiting for the fullness of what it means to live with Christ to be revealed in us. So we're suffering because we don't see it. We don't always get to see our, our faithfulness. And we don't always get to feel what it means to be totally free. Because we still struggle with things, don't we? We sin and we start to feel shame. And we say, what is wrong with me? Did you ever ask yourself that question? That's a question we should never have to ask ourselves because we're adopted. There's nothing wrong with us. We're complete. But yet we don't always feel it because it hasn't been revealed in us yet. So he says, inwardly, we groan for this because we say, I want to fully understand what is true about me. where we'll be fully revealed in his image as fellow heirs with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but this is huge. If you've ever struggled spiritually, if you've ever struggled with that, this should be huge because all of those struggles that keep us from experiencing who we are in Jesus, things like feeling inadequate, doing that thing we said we would never do again and we do it again, or beating ourselves up, or walking in shame or unforgiveness, and we're just walking in all that, and we say, I don't know, all of this will come to an end. And we will see ourselves as God sees us. Unfiltered. In fact, that day is coming where we can say, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a lot of us know 1 Corinthians chapter 13 because it's all about love, right? But we know we we don't love perfectly and we can never fully understand love. But there will come a day where it's unfiltered. In fact, Paul says... About that day that's coming. He says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Do you know what that, 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 that awaits us? This struggle, the, the, the reason why we don't have it now is because sin is present. We still struggle with it. But, the, but when Jesus returns and glory When he returns in glory and puts an end to all sin, creation is renewed, right? Then we will be revealed, right? We ourselves will be revealed as his. 
That's why Paul says in Colossians, where he's saying, you know, if, you, if you've been raised with Jesus, seek the things that are above. Set your minds on the things in heaven, not on the things of earth. And he goes on to say in verses 3, he says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. But when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Or we will be revealed when Christ re is revealed. And you know what happens? Those people that persecute us for, 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 for our faith will then see. And hopefully they'll see before then. But they will see. And these struggles with sin that we've had and these struggles with ourselves internally, we will now, it will be revealed and we'll say, oh. And we can sing as we sang this morning, I am a child of God. Oh, I get that. <laughs> That's what is coming. But until that comes, guess what? We're facing storms. We're facing a big black wall that we're going into. But just through that, the best is yet to come. And this is what Paul's saying. You, you want to endure? Then we also, yeah, we, we got to deal with stuff we got to deal with. But never forget, glory is coming. All creation will be renewed, even our bodies or broken down bodies will be revealed. And not only uh, will be renewed, and not only that, but Christ in us will be revealed fully. So we can walk in him. Now, I don't know about you, but that is the greatest thing ever, isn't it? That is incredible. And it's coming. And Paul says, so wait patiently with hope. We can't see it because we see the storm but we can hope for it. And it will pale in comparison to whatever we will face. So be encouraged, weary traveler. The best is yet to come. So, as we battle through our week this week, you know, with our present sufferings this week, dealing with a constant reminder that our bodies are falling apart, they're not what we want them to be, be encouraged. We have a brand new model coming. It's on order. That will never fail. You know, as we face a world that fights against us, that's decaying all around us, take heart. There's a perfect world coming where it's going to be at peace. As we deal with the trials and struggles in our spiritual lives this week, and we're tempted to despair because we're not as we think we should be. Be encouraged because we will soon be revealed fully as who God wants us to be and who he's made us to be in Jesus. In short, Paul's saying, take heart, be hopeful, and rejoice. For whatever trial or struggle we face today pales in comparison to the glory that is coming and that awaits us in Christ Jesus. Suffering is temporary. The best is yet to come. Let's pray.